Hi, I'm the director of Francis Lawrence. I'm here today to break down a scene from The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Jessup. Four. Three. Jessup. Two. So what we have here is the very beginning of the 10th annual Hunger Games. You know, every time uh, I approach the beginning of the games, I want it to feel emotionally different. And one of the fun things here is the games are very rudimentary. We don't have any fancy elevators or anything like that anymore. Um, and what I really enjoy is the idea that everybody's getting walked out at gunpoint by peacekeepers, some people getting dragged out, some people getting shoved out, and they all have to sort of stand on their little circles. Uh, and we have a, also a very rudimentary, almost half-broken speaker system, hearing Lucky Flickerman doing the countdown to the beginning of the games, and then a very rudimentary buzzer as well that sort of kicks everything off. For the 10th annual Hunger Games, uh, because we're seeing the early, early days of the arena and the games themselves, we needed something that felt almost Colosseum-like, almost like a, a, a place you would find in Rome. And uh, my production designer and I, uh, searched, uh, Uli Hanisch, the production designer, searched around the world and found a fantastic arena called Centennial Hall in Wrocław, Poland. And luckily we were able to secure it for about six weeks. It was the very beginning of our schedule. We uh, got to shoot there um, right away and put our games in. And they let us do a lot. We had to add a bunch of rubble, a bunch of dust, a bunch of dirt. We also did some digital augmentation to the walls. There's a big sequence early on with explosions that damages the, the, the structure. This is the first time um, in any of the stories and any of the games where because of explosions, the landscape of the games have changed. And so when you see the rubble, that's all because of these explosions that have now blown holes into the floor, giving access down to tunnels or access into sort of air vents that's put a big pile of rubble in the center, which you can tell is probably the beginning for the idea of the cornucopia that's set in uh, the center of the games after this. At this point of the movie, there's a sequence that happens the night before the games uh, where Coriolanus has come up with a plan. He's seen how the landscape of the arena has changed and he's gone to visit her in the zoo where she's being held captive before the games. And he tells her a plan to go run down into the tunnels that are underneath the arena and to go hide and not to go with anybody, not to wait for anybody, not to go for any weapons. Um, but we do get a sense that Lucy has made friends with one of the tributes and the tribute from also from District 12 and they want to protect each other. And he's gotten increasingly more, more sickly from some strange wound he has on his neck and she wants to take care of him. Um, so when the games start, instead of her running to the spot that Snow wanted to run to go and hide, she goes to try to find her district partner so she can try to help him the best that she can, which of course puts her in danger um, from some of the stronger tributes like Reaper and Coral. One of the sort of core aspects of the movie is the relationship between Snow, young Snow, and Lucy Gray. And Tom and Rachel have great chemistry, which is fantastic, but it was really fun to sort of play with the, the relationship and the mystery of the relationship because the two have this kind of mutual need for each other. You know, Tom wants her to listen to him and to win because if she does, he does. She obviously needs him, he's her mentor. She needs him to try to win because that way she actually survives. So there's this mu mutual need, but there's always a bit of a mystery of whether or not their feelings for each other are true. For a sequence like this, we spend a long time choreographing it. I work with my stunt coordinator, Scott Atia, uh, very, very closely. And what typically we'll do is we'll take the sort of beats that are important for the story 
and we'll kind of map that all out. And then we'll draw diagrams of what we think the arena is going to look like and where we want tributes to be. We also have a sort of another list of we have to know which tributes are actually supposed to die in the sequence. Um, and then we kind of send Scott off with a bunch of stunt people to start to choreograph. And one of the things that I also wanted to do was, for the most part, to have shots link up and last for long periods of time. And we usually also very focused on Lucy Gray. So he would choreograph some of the fighting and the battles and what everybody's doing because you have close to 24 tributes in this arena all sort of vying for, you know, for weapons and fighting with one another. He'll choreograph all of that and we'll start to design the kind of camera moves around that. Once we lock in on all the story beats and what the fighting is all like and who's dying and where they end up and, and get the story right, we then bring the actors in we train them in the sequence, almost like learning a dance. And then we bring our camera operator in and the cinematographer in, and we start to choreograph the camera moves. And this is all done on a stage, not even on set yet, not with the big cameras, but even with just like iPhones and things like that, so that we have everything perfectly planned out, so that on the day when we're there and everybody's in costume and hair and makeup, and we've got all the rubble around and you know the set pieces, we can move really efficiently through the sequence. What's interesting about this, um, and this all comes from the book and from Suzanne, is that, you know, uh, Lucy Gray, who is the female tribute from District 12, often people compare her to Katniss, who is also the female tribute from 12. Um, they are very different people. What they share in common is that they're both really intelligent and they're both survivors. It's how they do their different things that are, that are very, very different. You know, Lucy Gray is a performer. She's an extrovert. She uses charm. She knows how to manipulate. She can flirt. Um, and she's very, very smart and quite cunning. Whereas Katniss is a little more sort of introverted, quiet, introspective. She's a hunter. She's more capable with weapons. Um, so very, very distinctly different kinds of characters. Choosing Rachel, she was my first choice to, to play Lucy Gray. Um, I had seen her in West Side Story. She's a very, very talented actor. Um, I knew that she could sort of play all the different facets that we needed for, for Lucy Gray. Um, there's also music as a big element in this movie, and, and Rachel has an amazing, amazing voice, uh, which made the songs fantastic. Uh, but, you know, what I really like is that Rachel as an actor, and Lucy Gray specifically, is not really built to be in, arena, in an arena and fighting. And so I like that sort of fish out of water feel that she, and especially in this kind of rainbow dress that's so specific to her, kind of stands out um, in this arena filled with you know dirt and dust and, and rubble. You know, the dress for Lucy Gray is an iconic piece of the story. You know, this was something that was described in the book that was written by Suzanne Collins and became an iconic piece for Lucy Gray and a very important part of the story. Trish and I started talking about it and started talking about, you know, how the dress has been passed down. It was her mother's. It's passed down to her. Um, Trish wanted to design something that felt authentic to the location of District 12, to the idea that she's part of this sort of traveling troupe of musicians and performers. There's a slight can-can element to it, but also this kind of West Virginia, the hollows of West Virginia sort of feel to it. But then Trish also knew that we were gonna be doing a lot of different things. She was gonna to have to run around, she was gonna to have to roll around in the dirt, she was gonna to have to be able to move freely. So a lot of the sort of practical design of the dress, Trish had to be very, very smart with so that it would work in sequences like this. Yes, Jason, Jason, we gotta go. Come on, we gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go.